This week we read in the parashas Vayakel. Vayakel Moshe is called Adas in the Israel. Moshe assembled the complete congregation of the Israel, the Yom and he said to them, Elad Vorim Ashetziv Hashem Lasososom. These are the things that Hashem has commanded me to do. So over here, there's a Yalkut, which is the Midrash, by Yakel, Moshe, Rabbi Seinu Bali Agodo Omrim. Our rabbis, the Agaras say, Mitchila Satora, but so far, Aimba Parsha Nema Barosha Vayakel. From the beginning to the end, one doesn't find a portion which begins with Vayakel, and he assembled. Elozos Bilvod, this is the only portion. Omra Korish Brochu, Asil Hokilos, Gedolos, Drushel Lifneem, Berabim, Hilche Shabbos. Hashem says to Moshe, gather large assemblies and lecture before them in a public setting, the laws of Shabbos. Kedei sheyilmudu mimcho doros haboyim lahakil kilos behol Shabbos or Shabbos. So the future generations will learn from you that on Shabbos they should gather large gatherings of, of Jews. Belichnos boti medroshos. They should gather into the study halls. Lelami de lahoros liYisrael divrei Torah. Isav heter. To teach and to elucidate to the Klal Yisrael, the words of Torah which pertain to Isa Veheter, what's not permitted, what is permitted. Kedei she shmi hagodol miskalis bin bonai, so that my great name should be extolled among my children. By having large assemblies and teaching them the laws of Shabbos, which pertain to what's not permitted, what is permitted, this will cause that my name should be extolled among my children. Now, ha the obvious question is, a person is fully proficient in the laws of Shabbos. How does somehow that cause that Hashem's name should be extolled among his children? How do we understand this? The Chofetz Haim writes in one location, that Shabbos is a fundamental of Judaism. Why? Because the Gemara tells us that a person who violates Shabbos for whatever reason, even not as a heretic, even not defiantly, just purely as priority-wise, what we call a mumen l'teovon, it's purely because of his desires his conveniences. That's why he violates the Shabbos. It's considered as if he denies the Torah its entirety. It's referred to as Muma Lechala Torah Kula. He's a heretic who, as if he denies, rejects the Torah its entirety. Why? So the commentators explain that what is Shabbos? Shabbos is a testament that God is the creator of the world. If God is a creator, if the world is random, existence came out random, Randomly, you'd say, there's no rhyme or reason. But if there's a creator, and every aspect of creation was created with a specific intent, now the question is, that means there's purpose. It was created with an objective. It's not random. So if you observe the Shabbos, and we being God's testament to the world, that Hashem is the creator to indicate that the world is not just happenstance, it didn't come about randomly, but it came about for a purpose, and every aspect of, of existence has value and purpose, then a person will live his life differently. If you violate the Shabbos, and you don't emulate Hashem, six days you shall work, and the seventh day you shall refrain, therefore, it's as if you're rejecting, you're denying God. So he explains the Chofetz Chaim, he says, you have a person, he's a doctor, and he hangs out a shingle, and it says on the sign, we'll not be back for two weeks. So what does that mean? We'll not be back for two weeks. That means he, he still has the location, except he's absent at this moment, but he's coming back. 
What about if you come back into two weeks, you find the shingle was removed? If the shingle's removed, that means he moved out. He's not coming back. Person doesn't keep kosher. Doesn't keep dietary laws. Not lahachis. Not out of defiance. Because he prefers, for whatever reason, a non-kosher cuisine. That's what he prefers. Or because kosher meat is more expensive. is more costly than non-kosher meat. So it's not out of defiance. In that area, he's considered an apostate. But the rest of the Torah is considered a credible Jew. Why? Because the fact is, you still believe in God, except you have your Achilles heels, you have your weakness point, your weak points in these various areas. But if a person denies God, everything becomes irrelevant. You've taken down the sign. God says, as long as you observe the Shabbos and you declare to the world that I am the creator, then I'm here. The moment you have no regard for the Shabbos, and it's your, by your whim or choice, you transgress the Shabbos, God says, I'm not here. The shingle's down. God's not coming back. He's not coming back. We find that there's a word from the Shalom Kodosh. He writes, if you take a look at the text of the Friday night Shon Esrei, Amido, it starts, Atoki Dashto. You've sanctified. The morning Shachris, morning service, Amido. Is Yismach Moshe b'Manos Cholko. Moshe rejoiced with the gift, the gift of his portion. And then Mincha is Ato Echod b'Shimcha Echod. You are one. Your name is one. Mi Kamcho Yisrael Goy Echad Boritz. Who's like the Jewish people? There's only one such nation in the land. What exactly is there a during the week? There's a uniform. Amida, we say three times a day, identically, except for the closing bracha. Whether it's Sim Shalom or Shalom Rav, that's the closing bracha. But all the other blessings of the Amida of the Shemones are identical. But yet, on Shabbos, although the blessings are seven blessings, but the introduction in terms of the Shabbos, Ato Kidashtra, you've sanctified, Yismach Moshe, Moshe rejoiced, Ato Echot Shimcha Echot. So he goes to explain that the Gemara tells us that in regard to the festivals how do they come about they come about the high court of Israel has to declare that the month is is holy they say Mekudosh Mekudosh after they accept testament when they saw the new moon they declare the first day of the month whatever the first day of the month is that will determine when the 15th of the month is when Sukkot is, when Pesach is, when Shavuos is, whatever the first day of Sivan is, when Rosh Hashanah is. Rosh Hashanah is the first day of Tishrei. So if the, the first day of Tishrei is declared as the first day by the Sanhedrin, the High Court of Israel, so who makes the determination of when we have the sanctity of the Yom Tif? That's determined by the Sanhedrin, by the Vezdan. That's Mekadish Yisroel Vazmanim. God sanctified the Jewish people and subsequently they go and sanctify time. But Shabbos, prior to the Jewish people even coming into existence, Shabbos naturally from the very beginning of creation was innately holy. It was a holy day. Now who sanctifies the Shabbos? Baruch Atah Hashem, Mekadesh Shabbos. God is the one who sanctifies the Shabbos. That's our Shabbos. That is the basis for the sanctity of Shabbos. Now, how does the sanctification of Shabbos come about? How did God sanctify the Shabbos? The Torah tells us, for six days God was creative. On the seventh day, God refrained from creation. Why? Because creation was completed. What, so what happened, what happened on the day that he refrained? Bo Shabbos bo menucha. Shabbos came, now there was total tranquility. It was menucha. But what gave that wholesomeness, that tranquility to existence? God entered into existence. God's presence became 
the dwelling location. For God became the terrestrial level. Until existence was created, there was no existence. When it's completed, now God enters into existence. So the sanctity, the base for the sanctity of Shabbos is God's location, God associates, associating himself with the terrestrial existence, with existence. Sinai wanted to become holy when God descended on the mountain. He ascends, it's no longer ho holy. The burning bush, why was it Admas Kodesh? Why was, the, why was it hallowed ground? Because the Shekhinah, because the Divine Presence was there. Is whatever God is associated with, that is the base of her holiness. So why is Shabbos holy? Because God is associated with the Shabbos. God is associated with the Shabbos. That's Mekadosh Shabbos. Yom Tif, Bezdin, the High Court has to sanctify the day, then God enters into existence. So the Shalom Kodesh explains it this way. At the very beginning of Shabbos, what happens? The closing bracha of the Mayrib service, Friday night, is Ufros Oleinu Sukha Shlomecha. You should spread upon us your tent of peace. What is the tent of peace? That's Shechina. That's God's entering into existence. When you're in God's hand, then you're what? You have every level of protection, every level of peace. That's a fros oleinu. We're asking God to spread his sukkah shalom upon us. That we should be associated with his divine presence, with the Shechina. The, it's cited that the Arizal, that when they would say, he would stand out of respect for the Shekhinah, because that was the moment the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, would enter into Shabbos. So out of respect, out of reverence, he would stand. That's a Froselein Sukha Shlomecha. So what's the beginning? When you marry a woman, the various stages of marriage. This Kedushin, that's the betrothal. You give the ring or something of value to the wife, to the prospective wife in the presence of the witnesses. You say, Hareyat Mekudeshesli. That's betrothal. That's the beginning of the marriage relationship. And then you have the chuppah. Chuppah is you bring the wife into your domain. Now, chuppah is what? That's simcha. That's you celebrate. That's the wedding. You come out of Yichud, out of sequestering yourself with your wife, you celebrate the wedding. And then afterwards, ultimately, afterwards, you consummate the marriage. Right? That's the unification of the husband and wife. So he says, the Shalom Kodesh, the beginning of Shabbos, the Shekhinah is at one level. It's at an elementary level. Ato ki dashto. That's Kedushin. That's the betrothal. That's the beginning of the relationship. As the day progresses, the morning comes, Yismach Moshe Ramnos Chalko. Now we speak about Simcha. We're rejoicing. We're celebrating. Of course, this is Chuppah. Mintra time, which is after midday, the Kedusha, the holiness of the day, intensifies. God's presence and existence intensifies. That's when we unify with God. This is Ato Echod V'Shimcha Echod. You are one. Your name is one. There's a unification of the one and the one. And that's why that's the Echod. That's the unification of Hashem with Klal Yisrael. Therefore, it's cited that the Arizal, he would go to the mikveh, immerse himself in the, in the ritual pool at different junk, junctures of the day. It would be before Shabbos to prepare for the first relationship. Atokidashto. He in the morning to the next level. Of course it's another level of Kedusha. The Shekhinah now enters at another level. Then he'd go again before Mincha, because now it's another level of engagement. You're engaging with the Shekhinah at another level. I'll give you an example. The Morale of Prague says this and the Orchaim Kodesh says in one location. We say that um, Mishnah says that if ten Jews study Torah the Divine Presence is among them. If five Jews study Torah, the Shechin is among them. If three Jews study Torah, the Divine Presence is among them. And if two study, and if one studies, 
also the Shechin is there. So the obvious question is, if the Shechin is there when you have one Jew studying, it's obvious when you have ten. So what does it mean? We're speaking about ten, five, three, two, one. So what does it mean, Shechin Beinayim? So the Maral and the Rechaim says, they will say this, that the different intensities of Shechina. When there's ten, it's a different dimension of God's presence. That's one level. So you'd say maybe only if it's ten, anything less than ten, he doesn't associate, no, even five. But the five is not, may not be the intensity of ten. What about three? Five, the Shechina is there. Three is less than the five. Shechina is there, but to a lesser degree of intensity. Two, also, but it's not the same as, as the three. And the one is not the same as the two. Mm-hmm. But in every one of, of the, of the le- levels is Shechina Beinayim, but a different degree of Shechina. The same thing, Shabbos begins, Ato Kidashto. That's the Kedushin. The morning comes, it's Yisrach Moshe. That's the Simcha, that's the wedding day. That's the celebration of the wedding. Mincha, it's another level. That's the Mincha. I once heard from a Mashgiach, who was a person, his name was Reb Leibel He was a grandfather of Reb Kiveger. And he was very, very innovative in making up different kinds of mitzvahs or rituals which he drew from his understanding of other things. For instance, we find that Avraham Avinu he was engaged in a dialogue or with, in a communication with Hashem. After, it was the third day of his, his circumcision. And all of a sudden, he sees wayfarers coming. He's sitting at the entrance and he says to Hashem, excuse me, I have to go attend to the needs of the, of the wayfarers. So from here, the Gemara says, but you're engaged with the Shechina. You're engaged, receiving a communication with God. How do you interrupt the conversation to go host wayfarers? So the Gemara says, in Shabbos, from here we see, Greater is hosting guests than receiving the Divine Presence. Because otherwise, how did Abraham interrupt his conversation with God to go accommodate the needs of the guests? So we see from here, Mikan, from here, the Dolach, Nosis Orchim, greater is hospitality than Kabbalah's Pnei Ashkina. Now, in a shul, when you start the service on the Omud, usually you have candles burning, or you have lights. Why do you have lights? You have lights because, when, when you, like, you have a Ner Tomit. In a shul, you have, a, like, this ongoing eternal candle. Because since the Shechina, is always in the shul or in the base medrash, in the study hall. Therefore, that's an indi- out of respect, you have that light burning. So where the shechin is, you have candles, or you have the light. During the tefillah, right, you light candles. Also, because you're standing, you're having an audience with Hashem, the shechina, therefore you light candles out of respect for the shechina. Correct? Good. So now the question is, when you have guests... Do you light candles? So he says, Rabbi Leib Lechoset says, if Gedolach loses or Chimmi Kabbalos Pnei Ashkina, if Hashem values hospitality more than his uh, communicating with him, so if out of respect you light candles when the Shechina is here and hosting guests is greater, you light candles when you have guests coming, when you ha- during hospitality. That's what he extrapolated from what? From Gedolach Achlos or Chimmi Yosef Kabbalos Pnei Ashkina. Those were labeled lechosit. So now, the Gemara tells us why do we light candles on Shabbos? Right? We light candles. There's a rabbinical mitzvah that a person is supposed to have can- light candles for Shabbos. We say bracha lahadlik there shel Shabbos to light the candle of Shabbos. Everybody agrees. Minimally, you have to have two candles. One for Zohar, one for Shomer. The first tablets, it says Zohar Shomer Shabbos Lakacho. Remember the Shabbos to keep it holy. And the second set of tablets, it says, Shomor Yom Shabbos Lekacho. That's the refrain. So we have one candle for Zohar, one candle for Shomor, minimally. Other people have other customs. They, they, they light for as many people in the household, for the children, the husband and wife. 
But everybody agrees, minimally, you have two candles. So why do you have two candles? So Morris says, for Sholem Bayes, of course, you can't function in the dark. So therefore, you illuminate the home to have light, to be able to function and, and, and celebrate the Shabbos. You can't celebrate in darkness. However, according to what we're saying, what is Shabbos? Shabbos is the Shekhinah enters into, into our domain, into our lives, into our existence. So the lighting of the candles, similar to when you light the candles at the Omut, before the Amidah, before the Tefillah, which is an indication that the Shekhinah is here, identically, when Shabbos begins, what, you light candles right before Shabbos, to accept the Shabbos. Because that's, out of respect for Shabbos, you light candles. But into whose home does the Shekhinah come? The home that they observe, Zohar Shamar. The home that they observe, the positive commandment of Shabbos. Zohar Yom Shabbos Lakacho. And Shomer Shabbos Lakacho. And they observe, they refrain from doing the creative activity, what we refer to as the 39 Malachos, the Zohar V'Shomer. But if Chas V'Shomer, a person doesn't observe the Shabbos, the Shekhinah doesn't enter into his domain. Doesn't enter his domain. Shulchan Aruch rules, code of laws, that regardless of what you have on your head, on your mind, during the week, which the moment Shabbos comes, you're supposed to put all, all that out of your mind. You're not supposed to think about it. Why? Because Shabbos, we say a person dresses differently on Shabbos, a person speaks differently on Shabbos, we walk different, our stride is different during the week, we take large strides, Shabbos we take, Hilucha b'Shabbos lo yiki, Hilucha b'chol, Right? Our walking, our strides on Shabbos should not be as our strides on during the weekday. Our dress, our speech. We don't discuss business on Shabbos. Everything is shame. Why? Because Shabbos is special. Right? So you'd say, because you have to somehow extricate yourself from the morass of the weekday. Now, could you imagine a person gets a call that the king wants to be hosted, hosted in your home? That's what you get a call and you have certain financial issues on your mind. Do you know what it means? That you should have the privilege to host the king? This is the ultimate privilege, the ultimate honor. Whatever you had in your mind, in a moment is gone. It's totally cleansed from your mind. You're preoccupied with the excitement of having the privilege to attend to all the needs of the king. And this is the ultimate king. Let's say a person still is attached to other things in his mind and his emotion. It's a disrespect. Because if you truly would revere and value the king sufficiently, it is impossible to have anything else in mind other than the king. The preparations, the merit, the privilege, whatever else it goes with that. So how could you be worried? How could you be down on Shabbos? If you're down on Shabbos, it's a little bit of a problem. Right? So therefore, we say, you speak differently on Shabbos. The king is here. Could you imagine? The king comes to your house. What do you speak about? You're going to speak about the money you lost in the stock market. To the king, it's all meaningless. It means nothing. What are you talking about? Is there something wrong with you? Is that what you talk about? In the presence of the king? You dress? How do you dress this way? The king is here. The Shechin is here. Where's the respect? Evidently, it's a problem. You don't value that. You don't acknowledge that. What about the way you walk? You walk in a more refined manner. In the presence of the king? Where are you rushing off to? Again, it's, again, it's an issue. It's not sufficient reverence, sufficient respect. Therefore, you speak differently, you dress differently, and you, sp and you what? And the subject matter is different. Everything is different. What happens if it isn't different? See, there's a claim against the first Lachas Sholem. Now, Minig Ashkenaz, the custom of Ashkenaz is, Shabbos, we say in Aramaic prayer, prior to the Musaf, Yikum Porkan Min Salvation should come from heaven. And what do we ask for? We ask for health. We ask for good sight, good, good, good vision. We ask for children should be well, or physical things. 
What relevance does this have to Shabbos? What relevance? And then we say Mishaberach afterwards. But what, what, why? What is all this? And Hashem should watch over the, the Torah scholars, the leaders, the Torah leaders. Why all of a sudden this? The answer is it's not simple. Are we really on par? Even though outwardly we may be playing the role, but in, in, inwardly, our minds, our emotion, we should be ecstatic. Do you see everybody ecstatic about Shabbos? People look in their watches, when is it going to be over with? You know? So they can call uh, whatever it is. They can see what kind of emails they got. And speak to the stockbroker. Or whatever else after a Yom Tif. That That's what happens. If that's the case, there's a serious claim. There's a tremendous level of prosecution. If there's prosecution, Chas Sholem, you know what happens? It has consequences. One has failing health. One has failing eyesight. One, God forbid it, it compromises his family, his children. So Rabbi Yudah Chosid says, that's what we say the special tefillah of Yukum Perkin Min Shmayo. We say to God, there should be a salvation despite our shortcomings. He should protect our health. Give us health. Give us eyesight. Protect our families. All that, because factually, we're far from perfect. That's why we, we say this tefillah, this special prayer, this special supplication, right before Musaf on Shabbos for that reason. But that's the essence. So this is Atuki Dashto, Yisrach Moshe, and what? And Ato Echod V'Shimch Echod. The Gemara tells us in one location that a non-Jew is not permitted to observe the Shabbos. That a non-Jew keeps the Shabbos, he's liable for the death penalty. Why? Why is it so serious? He also wants to have his day of rest. Every religion, they have the day of rest. The Christians have Sunday, the Muslims have Friday, and Lahabdil Elif Abdullahs, we we have Shabbos. Because we're a testament to creation. Sunday has no relevance to creation. Friday has no relevance to creation. So by them, it's a day of rest, whatever that's called. So why, if a non-Jew observes the Shabbos, why, is he, why does it have such serious liability that he's deserving of the death penalty? So Similarly, would say, if a person goes, today, you know, the law is so ignored and so... Over, glossed over at one time the person was not in the army and we were in the army uniform with any type of insignia he'd be arrested even if you were an American citizen how do you wear you know, you, unless you were, you were a member of the armed forces and you, were, you served you weren't permitted to wear the uniform with the insignia on it it was, a, it was, it was against the law who, 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 who were you putting yourself forth as what what about if you're not even an American you're a, foreign, you're a foreigner wearing an American uniform. Who are you impersonating? And you're impersonating an American officer. You know, at one time you could be taken out and be shot for that. Shabbos, the Torah says, Osi Beni Veinechem. It's a sign, sign of distinction between me and Kal Yisrael. Ken Hashem Kadishchem. That I am God who sanctified you. All of a sudden, the non Jew, the Gentile, he's observing Shabbos. What's he observing Shabbos? It's like the imposter coming, say, you know, I am, I am the prince. Only the princes are admitted into this ball. If you're not a prince, you're not welcome. And you're coming in under false pretenses. You don't belong, belong here. Therefore, it's Chag Misa. That's a simple way you learn it. But if you take a look in the Medrash, the Medrash tells us that Shabbos, he says, could you imagine the king and queen are having a very private conversation? And somebody goes and eavesdrops on that conversation between the king and queen. The man says, don't you think that man deserves to be killed? Don't you think he deserves to be put to death? Where does this man have the audacity to infringe on the privacy of the king and queen to eavesdrop on that, on that communication? It's understood that person deserves to be put to death. So the Medjus says, Shabbos, there's an intimate relationship between Hashem and Klal Yisrael. The non-Jew coming in and wanting to observe to Shabbos, it's like eavesdropping. You don't belong here. 
So that infringement of that, it's not impersonation. It's an infringement. Because of that infringement, therefore he deserves to be put to death. So now, what is Shabbos? A person doesn't observe the Shabbos, as the Chavetz Chaim says. It's like, the shingle is off, Hashem says, I'm out of here. We said, when does the Shekhinah come? We have two candles, one for Zohar, one for Shomer. The first commandment, set of tablets, the second set of tablets. So when is the Shekhinah here? If you observe the Zohar of Shomer. If you don't observe the Zohar of Shomer, you have no relevance to the Shekhinah. You have no relevance to the Divine Presence. The Divine Presence doesn't enter into your home. It doesn't enter. That's the shingle has been taken down. But if a person does observe the Shabbos, then what happens? Then you have relevance to the Shekhinah. So therefore, I was thinking, one approach, Hashem says to Moshe, let the future generations, as you're gathering large assemblies of Jews, to teach them in a public setting, the laws of Shabbos, is Hilchas Isav Heter, the laws which pertain to what's not permitted, what is permitted. The future generation should learn from you also. Kadesh Kolis Bing Bonai, so I should be extolled among my children. What's extolled among my children? That when do we have a sense? If, when is the Shekhinah here? If the Shekhinah is here, we have a sense of God. We have a sense of God's presence. If you have a sense of God's presence, then you sing God's, pra- then you sing God's praises. Then you extol Him. But if the Chavetz Chaim writes in his introduction to the third volume of the Mishnah Brewer, where over there it's a compilation and elucidation of the laws, that unless you study the laws of Shabbos, it is impossible not to violate Shabbos on a Torah level. Impossible. So if you're violating Shabbos, even though it's inadvertent, but factually, it causes a little bit of a, a separation between you and the Shekhinah. Let it be inadvertent. So if that's the case, the Shekhinah is not here. If the Shekhinah is not here, you have no sense of the Shekhinah. So by teaching them the laws of Isa Heter, of Hilfah Shabbos, in large assemblies, I will be praised among my children. Because my children will have a sense of who I am, and as a result of that, because the Shekhinah will be associated with them, therefore they will sing my praises. Chazal tell us that during the Regolium, the uh, festivals, all Jews came to Shalayim, to the Temple Mount, and any Gentile who came to observe the celebrations of Yom Tif, every Gentile came, he converted to Judaism. Why did he convert? Because he saw something that was so overwhelmingly impressive and alluring, he saw one people worshipping, serving one God, one high priest, one rit- approach, protocol of ritual, one cuisine, the level of uniform- uniformity of Claudius Royal with the context of opulence was so overwhelmingly impressive he couldn't control himself but not convert. They said, this is what I want. This is my thing. It, it was almost like a palpable feeling of the Kedusha, of the purity of Klal Yisrael. He, it was like magnetically drawn there. It was like a magnetism. That's what it is. So if a Jew understands the Hilcha Shabbos, what he could do, what he could not do, there's a sensitivity to Shabbos. And especially you learn the, 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 the fences I mean, the reason why a Jew is not permitted to touch something which has no relevance to Shabbos, what we call muktzah, it's off like money or something, a tool which has no relevance to the Shabbos, it's a fence for transporting. You're not permitted to transport from the domain to domain. So what do we engage in? Only engage in things that are necessities. Anything. So we have this discerning conscience, cognizance to discern between one thing and another. So this is how I'll be a kolis ben bonai. The Gemara tells us in Brochos, from the time of the destruction of the temple, the only thing God has in this world is Dalat Amashel Halocha, are the four cubits of definitive law. And it cites a verse, meaning the location where they study definitive law, that's the only location Hashem has in this world. 
So there's a famous word from the Panovich Rav. Mishachorav Beis Hamikdash. From the time of the destruction of the Temple, Ela Kodesh Baruch Hu Elo. Only. I mean, before the destruction of the Temple, the Shechina was in two locations. It was in the Beis Hamikdash, and it was in the location where they studied definitive law, halacha, Torah law. Now that there's no Beis Hamikdash, it is only here. It's no longer there because it's been destroyed. So what level of Kedusha are we speaking about? So if you study, you should have large gatherings of Jews studying, lecturing to them the laws of what's not permitted, what is permitted. Definitive halacha. We're not talking about abstract concepts which cannot be actualized and applied. Hilchas isavet, what's not permitted, what is permitted. How do I live as a Jew on Shabbos? How will I not violate, transgress the Shabbos? That's where the Shechin is. If the Shechin is there, then of course you have a sense of God. You have a sense of God. So then, I'm Eskolis Ben Bonai. That's maybe another approach. I don't know. The third approach, maybe you had to understand, is this. We as Jews, cited in Sforim, Chaim Voloshner, mentions this in the Nefesh HaChayim in his work that even the greatest angel cannot fathom the makeup of the Jewish soul. Cannot fathom it. Why? Because the Jewish soul it was created from under the Kisei HaKavod under the holy throne of God. That's how far up it is. That location is above the world of angels, even the greatest angel. So it's beyond the comprehension or the purview of the greatest angel. That's what it is. So therefore, even the greatest angel ca cannot fathom what Nishvas Yisrael is. Cannot fathom that. So you can imagine what, what, what the Nishama of a Jew is. The, the intricate makeup of Nishvas Yisrael We as mortals, does, does a person have a sense of his neshama? As I always mention, maybe we're intellectual animals. How do you know you have a soul? How do we know we have a soul? You, you sense your soul. Anybody who today says he senses a soul, you know, he has to be medicated. Right? You know, come off your, your high horse and come down to reality. What do you mean you sense your soul? You don't sense your soul. Well, it's, I, I feel this way. Okay? People have a lot of feelings. Right? How do we know we have neshama, as I always say, is because at Sinai, God revealed everything about our spiritual connection to Him, about existence. That's how we know we have a neshama. Because that's part of Torah Shabbat Peh, Torah Shabbat God infused man at time of creation with a neshama, v'yipak bap of nishmas chayim. He blew in his nostrils the soul of life, and why the Jewish soul is this or whatever it may be, that's part of the Mesorah. That's part of the tradition from Sinai. That's how we know what our soul is versus any other soul. And that's what we need. 212, 248 positive commandments, 365 negative commandments to address all the needs of this intricate, dimensional, multi-dimensional entity of spirituality where there's nothing in existence comparable to it in any existence in the terrestrial level, the terrestrial level whatever it may be, that's how we know that's the neshama a human being is endowed with physical senses how do you know if something's hot or cold? you touch it how do you know if something smells has a, a positive fragrance or a stench we're endowed with, with the sense of smell hearing, speaking Sing. But that's this is all reality. That's our senses. How do we have a sense of spirituality? How do we have a sense of our spirituality? Meaning, how do we activate our neshama that we should be able to relate to spiritual concepts and value them and revere them and relate to God that it should not be something abstract that goes beyond the intellectual? How? 
what is what is what is spirituality? Kedusha. Right? It's Kedusha, it's holiness. The word Kadosh means set off on another plane. Before you do a mitzvah, the text of the blessing which precedes a mitzvah is Asher Kiddushanu bi mitzvah He sanctified us with his mitzvahs and he commanded us. Whatever the mitzvah may be, Leishi Basuka, the mitzvahs are the medium through which we become sanctified. Although we're physical beings, we're physical, earthy. But if you if that physical entity engages in kedusha and something of sanctity, it becomes sanctified. Chavetz Chaim writes in one location: you take an unintelligible animal and you consecrate it. What we call a behema, an ox, a bull, a sheep, a goat, and you consecrate it. What is it? It becomes holy. If you benefit from it, you have serious liability. Because now it has, so he says, that an unintelligible creature, which has no soul, all that is a life source. If you consecrate it, it becomes holy. So a Jew who has a neshama, and you do mitzvahs, do you know what, what, kind of, what kind of sanctity it assumes? It's a whole different dimension of Kedusha. That's what happens. So you could take the physical... Although in its makeup, it's material, it's flesh and blood, and you give it a spiritual dimension. The moment you spiritualize your physicality, you have a sense of spiritual. Because now the physical has assumed a spiritual persona, a reality. You stand in the Amida, you have a sense of God, you have a sense of inadequacy, because you relate to His. His, his essence, which is infinite. You do a mitzvah. You sense it's Kedusha. But how? But that's only, only the Jew could sense it's Kedusha. Because a mitzvah is relevant to, 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 to the Jewish soul. As it says, Rav Chaim Vital says, as the 248 positive commandments, the 248 components to the Jewish soul, and each mitzvah, I say, each positive commandment corresponds to one component of the neshama. So there is a connection there. So when you do the mitzvah, it touches your soul. The non-Jew who doesn't have that kind of soul has no relevance to him. doesn't touch him. So if a Jew does the mitzvah with a proper intent, lishma for the sake of the mitzvah, with reverence, it brings about a sanctity. So we actually sanctify ourselves. So if that's the case, if you teach a Jew, hilchas isa veheter, so what kind of life are you going to live? You can live a life of Kedusha, a life of sanctity, a life with the emphasis where life, physicality, is only a means to an end. It's not an end unto itself. So material has no value unto itself. It's only to facilitate the spiritual. So then this physical, which facilitates, becomes an entity of, of Kedusha, of sanctity. So therefore, teach them on Shabbos, large assemblies of Jews, the laws of Yisav Eter, how to live as a Jew, which brings about Kedusha. Once they have a sense, they could sense Kedusha. That means they could sense my presence. If they could sense my presence, they should call this being Bonai, so I should be extolled, should be praised among my children. This is what a Baruch Hu was saying to Moshe Rabbeinu. But it's interesting. It's only Shabbos. Make these large assemblies on what? On Shabbos. So you'd say on a simple level is during the week we're, dis we're, we're distracted. You have endless distraction. Shabbos, since we're removed from the mundane and all the distractions, you could focus. But you could also say maybe Gemara tells us that Shabbos is Me'en Olam Abba. What is it? What's Me'en Olam Abba? So Me'en Olam Abba, what is Olam Abba? So Ramchal explains Olam Abba is having a relation with God. As we explained before, what is Shabbos? Shabbos is a time that Shechina, the Divine Presence, enters into this existence. But it's still within a physical context. So it's only Me'ein Olam Abba. It has a semblance of the world to come. It's not the world to come. So if you have a semblance of the world to come, and you have that sense of what it is, so then afterwards, so then you have a sense of what? You have a sense of God that touches your spirituality. There's a story... 
the morale of Prague had a brother who was blind. He was blind. And he was a very holy man. And he said that he had a Gemara in Shabbos, which was, he couldn't understand the Gemara. The Gemara speaks of a, a situation that um, if a person is lost in the desert and he loses the track of time and he doesn't know what day Shabbos is, so how should he conduct himself? So firstly, if you're in desert, it's a question of life-threatening. So you, seven days a week, you do what you have to do. It's not a question. You have to do. Which either you have to designate one day to be Shabbos. So you should not forget this. Such a thing as Shabbos. You don't know how many days you're going to be wandering in the desert till you finally, if you ever come upon a community. So either the first day, the last day, because you lost, lost track of time. You don't know what day of the week it is. So Ra's brother says, he just can't understand the Gemara. Can't understand. The, 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 the case is, is, how is it possible that Shabbos should begin and how is it possible one should not sense Kedusha Shabbos? How is it possible such a thing? Understand? He was so attuned. He was so spiritualized. He says, I can't understand. How could Shabbos come and, and not know that it's Shabbos? So how could you be lost in a desert and not know when Shabbos is? How could you not send Shabbos? Rabbinically, there's certain things we do during Abdullah. Right? We light the fire to commemorate the first fire that was created by Odom Rishon. The first fire which Odom had made was Motsoy Shabbos. We took two flints together and he created fire. And why do we smell the spices? It's like smelling salts. Because the Torah says, Vayi no fash. It's the end of Visham Renesa Shabbos. It says, Vayi no fash. And he rested. So the Gemara says that on Shabbos, every Jew receives a Neshami Yisera. We have an enhanced soul. And that enhanced soul allows us to have certain benefits, to enjoy certain things on Shabbos that we can't enjoy during the week. You enjoy, you know, it's like a person eats challah on Shabbos. It tastes different than eating challah Friday afternoon or on Thursday. A person has a mock Shabbos meal. Thursday. It's a different taste. Everything tastes different. Why? So the Mara says, because it's in the Shami Yisera. Because your, your, your soul is affected, expands in a certain way, and one of the ramifications that, that you're able to enjoy food in a different context, to another, another level. Okay? That's the Gemara. It's in the Shami Yisera. So why do we smell, what is the Shami Yisera? We lose the Shami Yisera. This enhancement is lost when a person get, goes into, into a, a tailspin. What does that mean? That's depression. You get depressed. So what do you have to do? Either you take medication or you get some smelling salts. Right? So you smell the spices that's to revive you to be able to what? To get back to yourself. That is the value of the psumim. The broch we say barbi psumim is part of the havdalah for that reason. That's what it is. So that's what Shabbos is. Shabbos is what? It's main olam abo. So I once either heard or I thought of it, thought of this, that I once told over a story that Rabbi Yodas and Abshitz, he would always debate the bishop in his location. And he'd always make a mockery out of him because they, they were always engaged in a, in a debate about, about theology, about religion. And this bishop one day said, I'm going to make a disgrace out of Rabbi Yodas and Abshitz. This was in the 17th century. So what did he do? They contrived this story that they found this a Jewish couple murdered in the forest and they found a little newborn child and they were looking for a Jewish family to adopt the child. But the bishop knew the whole thing was contrived. It was an, a Gentile child. They had the child circumcised and everything and he was enrolled in the local cheder in that community. And Rabbi Yonis the Apeshitz being the chief rabbi of the community, once a month he would go and he would examine the boys in their, in their lessons. And this child was, was a genius. And everybody thought he was Jewish. He was an orphan. His parents were murdered. And he's being raised by a very devout family. So the rabbi comes into the 
school, to elementary school, starts asking questions, and this little boy is raising his hand, raising his hand, and the rabbi doesn't call on him. And he watches this boy, and then he says, take him out of here, he's not Jewish. He said, yes, how do you know he's not Jewish? It's very simple. He says, all the other children, when they study Torah, they sway. This boy, when he studies Torah, he doesn't sway. That clearly says he's not Jewish. He says, why, when a Jew studies Torah, why does he sway? He says, if you have a fire, and you take a piece of paper and put it near the fire, what happens to the, what happens to the flame? It's drawn towards the, towards, towards the fuel. Torah is the fuel for a Jewish soul. So when a Jew, Jewish child studies Torah, he sways. Mm -hmm. It's like the flame being exposed to the fuel. This child has no relevance to Torah. His neshama has no relevance. That's not the fuel of soul. That's why he doesn't sway. <coughs> Shabbos is me'en olam habo. God's presence enters into the Shabbos, into our domicile, into our lives. If the neshama is exposed to the... So what is the, what is the fuel of our neshama? God. So what happens when he gets close to us? On the Shabbos, they expand. They're drawn towards that Kedusha, to the source. What happens after Shabbos Hashem withdraws from this existence? Motsoi Shabbos, that's why it's called Chol. It's called Chol, it's ordinary. So what? So the Neshama retracts. So it retracts. So there's a little bit of it. There's a downturn. Therefore, we have the B'samim to compensate for the loss. It's a beautiful Orachayim Kodesh. He says about Shabbos. Now, if we say if you violate Shabbos, it's like you violated Torah's entirety. Because there's a Shomli Yisro Shabbos, Lasos is a Shabbos. What's what's Lasos? It says Ela Dvorim B'Shetziv Hashem Lasososam. I mean, Shabbos is a refrain, right? If you don't violate, transgress the two, the thirty-nine classifications of Malacha. Or the subcategories, the derivatives. Is it lasos? It's not lasos. He's not doing. It's being passive. So what does it mean, lasos? So he says something phenomenal, Lord Chaim HaKadosh. He says, when we sinned with the golden calf, Avodah Zorah, if you do Avodah Zorah, it's as if you want, you rejected the Torah's entirety. Right? You can keep all the mitzvahs, but a person's a pagan. What's the value of the mitzvah? The mitzvah has no value. Basically, you don't believe in God if you're a person's a pagan. Correct? So that means every mitzvah mm -hmm. has been infringed upon and has been actually diminished. All tired mitzvahs, every one of them is di diminished. That's what happens. And the same thing with first and violate Shabbos. It's like you violate the Torah's entirety. So what happens now? You observe the Shabbos. Observing the Shabbos, although it may be being passive, but what is it? It's a reinstatement. Whatever is lacking, whatever is deficient, Whatever is choser is now being reinstated. So, that if you observe Shabbos properly, he quotes the Gemara, that one who observes the Shabbos, even if he has among his sins idolatry, he's forgiven. Why? Because observing the Shabbos is a reinstatement that every aspect where you deficient now is addressed. Therefore, it's when you observe it, although in the observance and passive, but what's the, what is the ramification of observance? It's a reinstatement. So the reinstatement is active and therefore it concludes lassos rather than just being passive.